This is a brief introduction to the anterior cruciate ligament. Uh, there's certainly a significant amount written about the anterior cruciate ligament. A PubMed search will provide uh, 17,000 results of articles written about the anterior cruciate ligament over the last roughly 40 years, uh, with the vast majority of them written in the last 10 years. Uh, but this overview is going to be a brief review of the anatomy of the knee, the anatomy of the anterior cruciate ligament, and considerations when uh, it comes to anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction uh, as well as uh, rehabilitation. To begin with knee anatomy, the knee is a modified hinge joint whose obvious function is flexion and extension. However, there is also varus and valgus uh, movement about the knee, which is uh, inward and outward motion of the distal tibia, I'm sorry, of the tibia uh, in the coronal plane, as well as axial rotation. The bony anatomy of the knee is such that the medial femoral condyle is slightly larger and more distal, which also creates a little rotation uh, in the course of knee flexion and extension. Uh, also of note is that the lateral tibial plateau is convex and therefore incongruent. Uh, and the knee relies on the lateral meniscus to provide some congruence within the lateral compartment. An evaluation of the anatomy of the anterior cruciate ligament, this figure demonstrates the concept of a four-bar linkage between the anterior and posterior cruciates. But the anterior cruciate is uh, typically about 33 millimeters long from its femoral origin to its tibial insertion, uh, but with a relatively significant range of 25 millimeters to 41 millimeters. Uh, its average diameter is roughly 10 millimeters. Uh, that ranges from 12 millimeters at the femoral origin uh, and potentially even more at the tibial insertion uh, to approximately 7 millimeters at its midpoint as it has an hourglass shape. In the femoral attachment, uh, there is a semicircular area uh, that the anterior cruciate ligament originates from on the posteromedial aspect of the lateral femoral condyle and the anterior cruciate ligament runs within the intercondylar notch. With the knee fully extended, as you can see on the right side of the image, the uh, fibers of the anterior cruciate ligament are parallel to each other. However, with the knee flexed at 90 degrees, which is often how the ACL is viewed at arthroscopy, these fibers crisscross, and the major bundles of the anterior cruciate ligament, as will be described uh, a little bit later, uh, are seen uh, uh, more in that twisted fashion. The tibial insertion of the anterior cruciate ligament is seen in uh, yellow in the image on the right. Uh, it's a broad, irregular, oval-shaped area that sits between the intercondylar eminences of the tibia, uh, just behind the uh, intermeniscal ligament. Uh, the posterior cruciate ligament inserts more posteriorly, just off of the edge of the tibial plateau, and actually inserts well beneath the uh, a level of the tibial plateau, approximately one centimeter below the uh, joint line. The anterior cruciate is made up of 90% type 1 collagen and 10% type 3 collagen uh, and is innervated by the posterior articular nerve, which is a branch of the tibial nerve as it traverses the popliteal fossa. Uh, the anterior cruciate also has uh, mechanoreceptors uh, and uh, this helps it in its proprioceptive role uh, in giving neural feedback to the brain about where the knee is in space. Its major blood supply uh, for both the anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments uh, are uh, branches of the middle geniculate artery. As touched upon previously, the ACL is composed of two separate bundles and these are named for their tibial insertion sites. There is a smaller anteromedial bundle that you can see inserts uh, distal to the, where this is labeled, uh, anterior and medial on the tibial insertion, and a larger, more bulky posterolateral bundle uh, that uh, crosses behind the anteromedial bundle when the knee is flexed. From head on, uh, which is the view most often seen arthroscopically, the anteromedial bundle sits over top of the posterolateral bundle when the knee is flexed. Uh, you can see that the anteromedial bundle uh, takes its femoral origin uh, slightly more posteriorly uh, and superiorly. Uh, I'm sorry, it's slightly more superiorly, uh, which is more posterior in this image. Uh, the posterolateral bundle takes its origin 
uh, slightly more uh, inferior on this image, which reflects more posteriorly in the extended knee. As mentioned with the knee in extension, uh, the intermedial and posterior lateral bundles are oriented parallel to one another, uh, but they cross when the knee is flexed. The uh, intramedial bundle is the tighter bundle when the knee is flexed, and the posterior lateral bundle tightens in extension, making it uh, the more important of the bundles in terms of function of the ACL as most athletic activities occur uh, at or near extension of the knee. Traditional single bundle reconstructions of the ACL uh, typically mimic the function of the anteromedial bundle only, although the tunnels uh, historically have been placed uh, in a mismatch with the anteromedial uh, femoral bundle and the posterior lateral tibial insertion. Uh, and so the traditional single bundle reconstructions uh, may not restore uh, rotational stability. Uh, double bundle reconstructions uh, may be better at restoring rotational kinematics, but it remains controversial as far as whether that is clinically important uh, and whether it does improve functional outcomes greatly to perform a double bundle reconstruction. In terms of biomechanics of the ligament, uh, we evaluate the tensile strength, uh, which is the maximal stress that a ligament can sustain before failure, uh, in this case under tension. The native anterior cruciate ligament uh, can uh, sustain approximately 2,200 newtons of force before failure, uh, which is roughly equal to the PCL, which is uh, slightly stronger at 2,500 newtons. The MCL uh, is substantially stronger than the ACL, uh, able to withstand approximately 4,000 newtons of force. And the lateral collateral ligament uh, can only withstand 750 newtons of force uh, in isolation. There are certainly other structures that uh, support the lateral collateral ligament uh, and increase overall strength to a varus stress. Uh, in evaluating the graphs that are used for anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction, a 10 millimeter patellar tendon graft can withstand 2,900 newtons of force. Uh, however, we also have to evaluate the uh, uh, strength of the uh, bone tendon interface uh, and the bone blocks of the patellar tendon graft uh, heal with bone-to-bone -bone healing after approximately six weeks. The quadrupled hamstring graft uh, can withstand 4,000 newtons of force before failure. Uh, however, it is greatly dependent on graft fixation and the strength of that graft fixation within the femoral and tibial tunnels. And soft tissue healing uh, of the graft within the tunnels takes approximately 10 to 12 weeks. The functional role of the anterior cruciate ligament is that it is the primary restraint to uh, anterior translation of the proximal tibia, especially with the knee in slight flexion. Uh, it's a secondary restraint to tibial rotation as well as to varus and valgus stress. The ACL has a complex arrangement of fibers and although we identify two separate bundles, there are thousands of uh, collagen fibers within each of those bundles that all act relatively independently. This arrangement, however, allows the ACL to have viscoelastic properties. This means that the uh, uh, strength of the uh, ligament is dependent on the rate at which it is loaded, uh, and that there is some ability uh, for the ligament to stretch slightly. Uh, this provides for some amount of flexibility. The ACL also serves a proprioceptive function, uh, as mentioned when discussing mechanoreceptor fibers, uh, and it is considered to be the sensory organ of the knee. Uh, in the United States, approximately 250,000 anterior cruciate ligament ruptures occur uh, each year, uh, making the incidence approximately 1 in 3,000. Uh, there are 100,000 reconstructions performed each year in the United States. 70% of all anterior cruciate injuries are secondary to sports activities, with the remainder coming from other high energy uh, injuries such as knee dislocations or uh, injuries with motor vehicle accidents uh, or other uh, uh, relatively uh, violent or high energy injuries. Uh, the highest risk of injury uh, with athletic event is with skiing and with soccer. And women are uh, at greater risk than men are in most sports, including in basketball, volleyball, and soccer, where there's about a three to four time 
a higher incidence of uh, or higher rate of anterior cruciate ligament rupture uh, in women relative to men. All ACL ruptures are acute injuries uh, as there uh, is no such thing as a uh, uh, overuse type of anterior cruciate rupture. Uh, there are also acute on chronic injuries of the ACL in uh, patients who have tried to rehab a uh, torn or partially torn ACL. Uh, but certainly all ACL ruptures are just that, traumatic ruptures. The typical uh, history from a patient is that they have uh, pain and rapid swelling of the knee after feeling a pop, typically uh, in a non-contact setting when their knee is in a slightly flexed and valgus position. Uh, certainly the ACL can be ruptured with a contact injury as well, however. Uh, pictured to the right is Dr. Joseph Torek, who's a member of the Temple faculty. Uh, he was uh, the author of a paper in 1976 published in the American Journal of Sports Medicine uh, titled The Clinical Diagnosis of ACL Instability in the Athlete. Uh, this was the first published description of the Lachman test, which is uh, now the uh, standard test performed for evaluation of an anterior cruciate ligament rupture. The test is performed by slightly flexing the knee to approximately 30 degrees and stabilizing the distal femur with uh, the inner hand as the outer hand uh, translates the proximal tibia anteriorly. Uh, interestingly, within that article, uh, Dr. Torg quoted Dr. Fred Allman, who said that an ACL injury is the beginning of the end of the knee. Uh, at the time, the anterior cruciate ligament was a controversial structure, with most people feeling that this was a vestigial structure similar to the appendix serving no function. Uh, and a small group of vocal sports medicine surgeons uh, uh, stating that uh, a neglected rupture of the anterior cruciate ligament would most certainly lead to uh, end-stage arthritic changes. And so Dr. Torg was one of the pioneers in uh, arguing for uh, anterior cruciate reconstruction to restore function, uh, as well as at the time thinking that this would stave off the progression of arthritis that we've since found out that it may be the injury itself that will predispose a patient to arthritis and not necessarily whether they have their anterior cruciate reconstructed or not. From an arthroscopic view uh, with the arthroscope in the femoral notch, uh, this probe is around the ruptured part of an anterior cruciate ligament. You can see the uh, hemorrhagic stump uh, remaining of the uh, ACL. Another, uh, uh, way to evaluate the anterior cruciate ligament uh, is to uh, evaluate the uh, medial wall of lateral femoral condyle uh, and demonstrate that in this circumstance, although there is a significant amount of ACL tissue behind the probe, uh, certainly at least the posterior lateral uh, bundle origin has been uh, ruptured. And in placing the arthroscope into the opposite portal and looking directly on the lateral femoral condyle, uh, you can see the uh, uh, anterior cruciate. Uh, and this is an arthroscopic image after an anterior cruciate reconstruction where you can see the uh, graft extending uh, as an anterior cruciate ligament would from the uh, more posterior aspect of the femoral condyle as uh, seen with the knee inflection down to its tibial insertion. In terms of how this is performed, there's uh, multiple graft options, uh, including using uh, a patient's own tissue, whether it's their patellar tendon or their hamstring tendons, or in some circumstances, their quadriceps tendon, uh, or using uh, donated cadaveric tissue. Uh, and there's also different options with regard to how the, that graft is fixed to the femur and to the tibia. And in this slide, you can see the options ranging from an interference screw uh, in the top left, where the screw is uh, uh, securing the graft within the femoral tunnel. Uh, in the middle and the top right are uh, devices uh, which uh, penetrate across the bone and across the tunnel, uh, securing the graft within the tunnel. And then on the bottom left, uh, which demonstrates uh, a uh, cortical button where the graft is looped through the suture that is seen here, and the button itself is uh, drawn through the tunnel 
uh, and placed onto the outer aspect of the lateral cortex uh, where it suspends the uh, uh, graft. On the tibial side, the typical uh, fixation as seen in the center is a tibial interference screw, uh, sometimes supplemented with uh, another way to fix uh, sutures from the graft uh, more distal to the tunnel. And of course, of uh, equal importance to the manner in which the anterior cruciate ligament is reconstructed, uh, the rehabilitation of the uh, uh, patient who has had an ACL reconstruction uh, really does uh, go a long way in determining whether that person is going to get back to their usual activities, whether it's athletic or just activities of daily living. And so the goals after anterior cruciate reconstruction, uh, although there's many ways to get there and many different protocols used, the goals stay the same, and that's to minimize the inflammation that occurs from surgery, restore motion of the knee, restore strength in the quadriceps, hamstrings, in the hips, and the core, uh, enhance proprioception since the uh, proprioceptive function of the ACL is lost when it's ruptured. Uh, the goal of rehab is to try to restore proprioception of the knee as well as dynamic stability, the ability of the knee to remain stable with uh, uh, athletic activities. Uh, and have other structures help protect the anterior cruciate itself. And ultimately, the goal is to return the patient to function and prevent a recurrence of the rupture, as well as to uh, prevent uh, injury to the contralateral anterior cruciate ligament. As said, this is just a relatively brief overview of uh, uh, what should be understood about the anterior cruciate ligament, uh, whether your intent is to continue on in orthopedics or to... Uh, uh, enter any other field in which you may see somebody with a knee injury. Uh, certainly if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to uh, contact me uh, by any means.